Good morning, Ron. Morning, Kath. How hey, are you? And, uh, uh, fine. Another great, great show for us today. Good morning, yeah, everyone. Absolutely. Today, today we're going to be talking about staying the course can lead to disaster. So, what does that mean now, Ron? Well, I, the, what prompted this is I'm I'm reading what I think a lot of people on this call are reading, and the the standard advice uh, when the market's correct is to stay the course, buy the dip. And I thought uh, it would be a good thing to talk to our viewers about uh, whether that makes sense because I'm, I'm sure they're seeing it. And maybe we can start with the next slide, Kath, just because it has a summary on uh, what we're going to talk about. Okay. Not this one, the next oh, one. No, that's, that's it. That's perfect. Okay. We'll, we'll start there. So saying the course is really makes sense if you're on the right course. And what we this is episode eleven now, season one, episode eleven. If we were Netflix, we this would probably be the the last episode of the season. <laughs> we, we, we got eleven now, uh, but I, I what we've been talking about in the, in the previous um, uh, episodes is that the course seems to be for baby boomers the standard sixty forty stock bond mix, and we've been telling our viewers that that's the wrong mix, and we're going to do it one more time here. Uh, but they go in a little more depth, but also uh, as we go through this, I'm going to remind the audience that we have whole shows, like a, our typical show is about 45 minutes. So I'm going to allude to four of our previous shows here. And um, I think you've got a link here, Kath, but but uh, just so um, people know, this, this is on SlideShare. So you can find it on SlideShare and go to all these links. And I uh, encourage people who, who want to take a deeper dive to, to go ahead and do that. So on the next slide, uh, we talk about what it means to stay the course. Wait a second here. Hang on a second. I'm ready. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, so this this is the recent history of the S&P 500, which is a index for the stock market. And it's dropped 34% when the uh, the COVID really hit the stock market just in one month. So from February 20th to basically uh, March 23rd, I think it was, the, the market went down 34%. Now, that was that was a time when people were, were telling you to stay the course. And by stay the course, they meant rebalance. And rebalancing means if you're 60-40, I'm going to stick with the 60-40 for now just because... I th we think that's where most baby boomers are. You would have been buying stocks as the market went down to try to stay at that 60-40 mix. And then as the market recovered to stay the course, you would be selling stocks because it would be going up and you'd be staying at the 60-40. And, and that's a built-in discipline. It has some merit in what's called time diversification. So you're selling as the market goes down. So you do sort of, uh, sorry, buying as the market goes down, selling as it goes up. Uh, that sort of dollar cost averages you and, and has some merit. So if you, uh, can we go back to slide cat? This, because sure. I want to, okay. Sorry. So one, one of the interesting things here is, see the market was down 34% that one month. And since then, uh, actually this graph goes through June 8th, um, the market was up 43%. But it still had not recovered. So on June 8th, the, the S&P was at 32.32. And on February 20th, it was at 33.73. So it's still down. And this, this is the arithmetic that people talk about all the time. So when you lose money in the market, you need to come back more than what you've lost in a percentage sense. So to recover that whole 34% loss, the market needs to come back 50%. So it's, it's a long way there by coming back 43. And then my question for this whole session is, uh, do you, what, what will happen if you stay the course? Where's the market going? And so I did this on June 8th when I was getting the show put together, but I can tell you today, uh, the market is still about where it was on June 8th. It's actually a little lower. It's around 3148. Uh, so it, it's, it's a little lower, but so, Let's look at what the course is. It's on the next picture, Kath. By the way, Kathy is my sister. Those of you who have seen the show before know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we. I, I'm the good looking one. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> 
So first allusion to previous shows, our episode three, which is available, we went through the history of uh, investment consulting and explained why 6040 is such a standard answer. And it's probably not going to go away, but there, there, we, we, we talk about something new that has happened in investment consulting. And it's this notion of what's come to be called a target date fund, where the emphasis is on not doing 6040 for people who have low risk capacity, which means they can't afford the risk. And baby boomers are in that group. They are in what's called the risk zone. And we're going to talk some more, remind you about what the risk zone is and something called sequence of return risk. But the typical uh, individual retirement account, IRA, is basically um, between 50 and 60% in equities. We're showing 50% equities in this pie chart. The typical target date fund at the target date. So if you're in a target date fund and you're planning on retiring this year, you are about 50% in equities right now. Uh, 40% in bonds, which, by the way, uh, oh, I just started, we started writing about this. The bonds right now are, are not safe at all. The, 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 the traditional view of bonds is that they, they are safe. But now with interest rates almost near zero, uh, and most of those bonds are, are relatively long, especially in target date funds, those are pretty risky bonds. So this, this is, as a whole... What we're really saying is this, there's roughly only about 10% of your portfolio that isn't reasonably safe. And what that means in terms of risk exposure, this mix of assets lost 30% in 2008. It lost uh, 15% in that quarter we just showed you, the, the coronavirus, uh, 30, 30, um, 35% loss. And I don't think this correction is over yet. So just be aware that you're sitting there in, in fairly high risk um, uh, asset allocation. Our recommendation is over on the right, and you're gonna look at that and say, well, that's really, really safe. I'm talking about 70% in safe assets. When I say safe, I mean, treasury bills, uh, we recommend also an exposure to what's called TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protective Securities. But in that space, we're talking about um, no more than five year uh, maturity in the TIPS. So very, very safe investments. And that's designed to protect for now. As you get through what we're going to describe to you as, as being called the risk zone, you can get more back into the market. But right now, your lifetime savings is at stake. And your number one objective should be to not lose those savings. So our recommendation uh, in 2008 lost 5% rather than 30%. And this first quarter of 2020, it, uh, it lost uh, 2%. Now, if, if you don't want to take our advice on the next slide, we thought maybe you'd want to talk to God. And believe it, <laughs> <laughs> he's, okay. he's, got to, he's got to have the answer. Yeah, there you go. So I, I, one, one of my friends who I think is, is watching this uh, shared this with me. And um, it, it, it's... The Talmud is not the, the Jewish Bible. The Jewish Bible is the Torah. Uh, but the Talmud is the interpretation of the Torah from uh, rabbis through the years. And in, in the Talmud, the asset allocation advice is, and it says exactly, it says, let every man divide his money into three parts and invest a third in land, a third in business, and a third let him keep in, in reserve. So a third, a third, a third, it's, it's an easy rule to remember. Uh, and unlike the previous, the previous slide uh, did not include your home. Uh, this slide does. So you sort of say, I, 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 I have about a half in my house, I'm sorry, a third in my house, about a third in stocks and bonds, and a third in very safe assets. Now that is still much more conservative than the 60-40. So if you just look at the non-real estate assets, this would be about 50% reserves and the remaining in, in equity and bonds. So it's very conservative. Um, whatever rule works for you and gets you away from this high risk 60, 40 uh, stock bond portfolio is good. So on the next slide, let's talk about why you need to be safe. And um, 
why we think you're not currently. So baby boomers really do need to protect their savings. They've, they're in this risk zone, and the risk zone is the five to 10 years before and after you retire. Uh, and that's when your savings are at their highest. You've left the workforce. You're going to start spending those savings down. And losses early on can totally undermine your standard of living in retirement. So it's very important for you to protect those assets. The second reason is the stay the course advice is mostly based on a, a historic belief that these uh, bear markets don't last very long, they recover fairly quickly. So what they're really saying to you is, is don't worry, this is gonna be over soon, you'll be fine, it'll all come back, it's all gonna be good. Uh, so those first two reasons are basically what I call risk management. Um, they, they, they're they not trying to call the market terms, they're not trying to say tomorrow's gloomy so I'm gonna get out of the market. <clears throat> the third reason is sort of like market timing. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the dangers that lurk ahead. And uh, one of them is COVID, but uh, it's not the only one. So let's start with talking about sequence of return risk on, on the next slide, Kath. Okay. Speaking of COVID, it's, it seems to be getting worse in some states now. Yeah, the, the, the current, this, well, we're gonna talk a little bit about this, but the, the current concern is that we're gonna get a second wave. And uh, what is that gonna do? Um, since you brought it up, one, one of the, well, we're going to talk about this, but the the estimated decrease in corporate earnings is at least 20%. Wow. So, one of the, so one, and that, I mean, some industries are going to do thrive here, like um, anything that has to do with Zoom is probably doing really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but other industries, of course, are, are hurting a lot. Um, but in the, in the meantime, the, the stock prices are, are pretty much, where they were before the COVID. So the way to view that is if the standard way to see if you're paying too much or too little for a stock is what are you paying for the earnings? Well, the earnings are down 20% and you're paying just as much as you were before. So there's, there's something is wrong with this picture and why investors who want to pay a premium, um, I'm gonna wander just a little bit here, but most people are attributing it to the influence of the of the Fed, who's injected three trillion so far, and maybe another two trillion into the economy, um, keeping bonds yielding almost nothing. And the explanation for why the stocks are going up is people um, they want to earn some money, so they're they're uh, they're not buying bonds; they're buying the stocks. The Fed is buying the bonds, and um, anyway, that's the rationale. It's, it's very crazy time. So this sequence of return thing, this this is an example. Of, you, if, you, if you Google sequence of return, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. But uh, what, what this is laying out is there are two paths here, a blue path and a red path. And the average return for each path is 6.6% .6 per year. Um, by the way, if, if you weren't spending money, so in, in this example, you're, you're spending $12,500 each year and increasing that by 3% a year. Uh, if you weren't spending money, you would end, uh, in this green thing, you would end up with uh, $1.7 million on a uh, $250,000 portfolio. So compounding is, is, is incredibly powerful. Um, but you are spending money. And what matters a lot is the sequence of return. If you weren't spending, you wouldn't care about the sequence of return. It's just an important uh, caveat. But in the red, curve, you have three losing years right out of the box, and then the rest are good years, so you still get the 6.6% .6 per year. In the blue curve, you get the three losing years at the end, and you can see you're substantially wealthier if you're, so if you're unlucky and you get bad years early on, you're going to run out of money pretty quickly. If you're, if you're just the opposite and you're lucky and you have good years first, and the bad years come at the end, you don't care so much anymore because, well, for one thing, you've had a lot of years to spend that money. So that's the notion of sequence return risk. And the, the risk zone idea is that basically you need to protect at least for the first five to 10 years while you're in retirement. And then after that, if you'd like, and you probably, your money won't last as long as you keep on protecting. So you probably would want to start to get uh, back into the, the market after you've been retired for, for five to 10 years. 
So uh, that's that. The second uh, motivation for staying the course is on the next slide, Kath. And this is a sort of a, a complicated table, but um, it divides uh, all the down markets. And the, the lower right-hand corner says that the, the average down market lasts about 299 days, less than a year. So that's sort of the underpinning for people saying, this, this will be over. It's not going to last more than a year. They never do. But notice how they broke that up. The first 12 down periods here were the Great Depression. So what they do is every little down period, they, 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 and when the market recovers a little bit, they stop the down period and reset the clock. So you have a little bounce back, it resets. But there are 12 of those. So during the Great Depression, which took more than a decade, there were, there were 12 periods where markets went down and came back, markets went down and came back, markets went down and came back. So if you start to measure the length of the, the down period that way, you get short little periods. But the reality is the depression took a decade. And here we have you know, baby boomers who will probably live longer than a decade. But you know, a decade from now is a pretty long time to go through a, a really serious uh, downfall in, in markets. Some people think, and this is a circle on the right-hand side, that the 2008, 2009, that this current thing could be worse than that and, and lasts a lot longer. And a large part of that belief has to do not just with COVID, but with other things. Before I forget, in episode six, we talked about what uh, baby boomers need to do in, the, in this COVID environment. So now please uh, take some time and Watch that show. It's uh, it'll be fun for you. And then, last but not least, the sort of um, scary part of where we are today is like market timing. It's on the next slide. And this one is uh, probably our most watched show. Uh, and and I think uh, so it's two reasons. So it's the ten reasons baby boomers need to invest more safely, and it's the threats. It's about the threats. Uh, and we did this show on February 18th. And one of the threats that we, we cautioned about was COVID-19. And you all might not remember this, but I think it was at least two weeks after that before the COVID was recognized. As right, a yeah. Yeah, we were way ahead of time. Yeah, so yay for us. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> we, yeah. We, get, we get it, I told you so. Yeah, right, yeah. So I hope we don't get any more I told you so's, but uh, this one slide. Uh, sort of highlights all of them that we discuss in the show in, in detail. So uh, just in, in the order they, they appear on the slide, stock and bond markets are over overvalued. Uh, when interest rates are zero, you know there's something wrong with the bond market, and that's the Fed manipulating bonds. Stock markets were, were very expensive before, and now that they're at the same price but with lower um, earnings, even even much more expensive. Folks are now talking about the real estate market being a repeat of the 2007-2008, um, uh, and I hope not, but that, that's, that's certainly possible. Uh, the other thing that is definitely true, the world has embraced this sort of notion that's called modern monetary theory, and it basically says the, the government, any, any entity that can print money, can print as much as it wants, what? and it won't matter. Just keep printing; it's all good. What? Oh my <laughs> gosh! So <laughs> it makes no sense. It, well, it doesn't to me, but there are you know smart people <laughs> than me who say, "Yeah, that's that's it's all good. Just just do as much with it as you want." I think part of the underpinnings of that idea is the government's presumably buying assets with that money. So in our case, it's mostly bonds, but some of that money is not buying assets. It's, it's being dropped from helicopters. Yeah, so right. I, I, it, it is. I mean, the, the, the relief checks that uh, you know, a lot of people got, that's not buying anything. It's just giving it to people to spend. Yeah, right. Well, I think a lot of people wondered, where did that money come from? You know, I mean, <laughs> if we've had it all these years, then why didn't we use it before? You know? <laughs> it's just um, the mechanics for that we discussed in the – this is episode 11, episode 9. 
uh, but the mechanics are really strange. So just, just in a nutshell, the government presumably um, would borrow that money, but we're out of borrowers. People aren't lending us money, much money anymore. So the last recourse is for the Fed to borrow it. So the Federal Reserve is basically borrowing money from, from the government. And, and it's essentially printing money, but not in the physical sense of running the, the printing presses. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird game, but it's going on. Uh, and the world debt's around $200,000 per person. And uh, so that, that's really problematic. Uh, and the stuff I've read, it's been said that the U.S. is still in the cat's, catbird seat because it's the cleanest, dirty shirt. <laughs> it's, it's, wow. Even though our debt is much bigger than the other nations, our our GDP is bigger and everything else, but it's it's a big problem. The other threats that, uh, I mean, could, could erupt any day, North Korea and Iran, mm -hmm. uh, that that's still in play. The trade wars, people think that with the COVID, uh, we're going to do something with China, but anything I, I've read so far looks like we're not going to retaliate, at least in, in trade wars. And I think that's smart. Um, we're, the debate is still on about whether we can get deflation or inflation, but I, I'm very much thinking we might get deflation first and then then hyperinflation. And and that's, that's terrible for the economy. Mm-hmm. And then the really scary thing for baby boomers, and this is when we spend a lot of time on in, in episode um, two. Yeah. Social, well, first of all, the, the official government debt is $24 trillion, just to put things in perspective. The estimated debt for Social Security, basically the amount that we've promised, we basically promised to pay about $24 trillion. So just a little bit more than the official government debt. Social Security, for the first time ever in 2018, did not take in enough tax receipts to pay all the Social Security benefits. So 2018 was sort of the beginning of uh, my, what might be called insolvency rather than bankruptcy. And the original thought was that Social Security would be bankrupt and run out of money totally in 2032. Uh, but now the revision has been with the, the COVID that's it happened sooner, 2028. Whoa. Yeah, this is serious. Medicare, you ready for this? What? The estimated promise for all the Medicare benefits is $47 trillion. Whoa. More than twice the official national debt. Oh, my goodness. And Medicare... Yeah. I know it's it's so if you add Social Security and Medicare to the national debt, it's it's over a hundred trillion dollars. Medicare is officially going to run out of money, and, and when I say these things, I get reaction from people say the government can't run out of money; Just, they got the printing press. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, which makes no sense either. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't. I'm not sure how people come up with these these uh, due dates, doom dates, maybe is what you might yeah. call it. But Medicare is supposed to be bankrupt in 2028. So. So sometime soon. So here, here's the point on all these, these scare things. Any one of these things is reasonably likely to happen sometime reasonably soon, uh, basically sometime in this next decade. And this is the decade when 78 million people are all in the risk zone, some early, some late, but they're all sort of in this five to 10 years before retirement. So Risk management argues for protecting yourself, but also these threats. And we warned you about one, and it's happened. Um, I, we're, we're saying you don't want to bet that none of these are going to happen in the next decade, because that would not be a smart bet. So the other thing that is, is I want to talk about is the disconnect that's happening right now. On the next slide, Kath. Okay. So uh, one of my friends at Capital Market uh, Consultants, uh, Barry Mendelson, publishes these, um, these indicators, I think about once a month. And I don't think I've ever seen all the needles in the red. So the economy is in the tank. Stock markets are way overvalued. And believe it or not, the, the investor sentiment is, is negative, even though the markets are going up. I'm not sure 
how that happens. Um, but I'm going to speculate a little bit on the next slide. Um, but while the market's going up, all the oh no, not not yet. I'm sorry, Keith. Oh, oh, I'm just, okay. I'm, I'm just saying what I'm going to do on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not ready yet. All right. All right. So in the meantime, the, the economy GDP was down five percent in the first quarter, but some people um, exaggerate that and, and report it as a twenty percent decline. What they've done is annualized, so they take the five multiplied by four, and that's twenty. That's 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 an exaggeration, but. This quarter that we're in right now will probably show a decline in GDP of 15%. So by the middle of the year, by the end of this month, uh, we'll, be, we'll be down more than 20%. A recession is defined as a decrease in GDP greater, greater than 10%. So we are officially in a recession. Now, what most people think, including me, is that the recession means a decline in the stock market. That's not necessarily true. We have had recessions where the market hasn't declined. We've had market declines where we haven't had a recession. Um, anyway, right right now we're in an unusual situation, but but uh, not unprecedented. But the stock market continues to get more and more expensive. It's disconnected from the economy, and now we can do the next slide because I, I think um, I'm, I'm doing this a little tongue in cheek, but I think. Investors want to believe that this COVID thing is going to be over quick. Everything mm -hmm. is going to be fine. Uh, we'll be back to where we were. We're going to have a vaccine. Yep. Uh, you know, and it's 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 this 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 other fellow wrote this. I love the word he called it. Hopium. Yeah. <laughs> it's it said drug investors are taking to make them euphoric about the stock markets, and even the, the worst news. A big increase in unemployment. There's this. There's that. The market goes up. Yeah. And uh, it's just it's, it's crazy. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people. Uh, I'm not alone and not understanding this. But part of what I think is going on here is this this thing that's been in the stock market for a long time is called FOMO. F O M O, fear of missing out. Right. So there are investors who say, "Hey, <laughs> my neighbor's getting rich. I don't. I want. I want a lot of that." Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, well, you know, Ron, I, I wanted to mention that, you know, there's a lot of people that end up not understanding that what really has happened to the economy. They just look at the stock market and, and uh, they look at their investments. But there's a lot of people that are really hurting. So I see where there is a recession. Yeah. And it may, if they don't want to believe it, I'm with you on this. Mm -hmm. OK, there's that quote. I won't get it right, but um, it's, it's a. Recession when it happens to other people and a depression when it happens to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, so I, I think that people are not living in, in the reality of what's really happening. They don't want to watch TV. And of course, media is not really reporting what's really, really happening as well. You know, um, there's a lot. People are losing not only their lives, but their livelihood. Their, their, yep. um, uh, and, and how do you come back from that? I mean, it's a panic situation. There's a health, financial and health, as we talked before, really intermingle with each other. Because if you've got a financial crisis, guaranteed you're going to get sick over it. That's right. No, it isn't. Um, I've, I've been reading a lot, but people who are optimistic about the path to recovery from COVID are thinking at least two years, probably three or four. So then that that's not just the financial recovery, but also the health recovery. Right. Uh, and one of the things I'll just throw out there that I, I read from a very thoughtful guy that even if there's a vaccine that's found, it's, it's likely that it won't be very effective on older people. It's just because our resistances and our systems are not as, as resilient as, as younger people. And there's so many underlying issues that go along with it. Absolutely. And, and this, this author who talks about that talks about the, uh, the, the, the cure for um, HIV. Mm -hmm. and there's, no, there's no cure. There, there, right. are, there are treatments that you know, make the symptoms a little easier to tolerate. But, um, and there's been how many years have we been trying to find a cure? Oh, so, yeah, since so, the 80s, the yeah, late 80s. There's no cure for AIDS. Yeah. So, um, 
hope, hopefully you'll find a cure for this thing, but that, that's certainly, certainly a lot of people are trying and a lot of people will get, whoever, whoever gets it will get rich. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so on the, on the next slide, Kath, I want to talk about our very first episode. Yep. And um, to, to tell people it's there. And the episode was about smart investing. And, and the four pillars, by the way, one, one of the free eBooks, if you uh, visit the website, uh, we'll give you the details here, but they're, they're pretty um, standard. So when, one of the first things we say in the, in the um, eBook and, and on the show is the most important thing you can do is to save enough. If you haven't saved enough, there's not much more you can do because <laughs> you don't have much to invest. So, so that's critical. Uh, but then from there, um, what you need to do is, is figure out your goals. And early on in life, it might be to send the kids to school, to buy a house, do a car, what, whatever it might be. Uh, and then you want to tie your risk to achieving those goals. And one of the interesting things we say in the, the, the episode about investment consulting, in the early days of investment consulting, the common practice was to try to get your arms around what is the maximum amount of risk you can get that client to take? When, when does it start to hurt? And that's the risk you want them to take, whatever that is. 100% in stocks, if you can take 100% in stocks, that's it. And the rationale underneath that was risk makes you rich. Now, that has changed a lot uh, thanks to, I think, more forward thinking uh, and a more holistic approach to investing. So now I think the notion is closer to what is the minimum amount of risk you need to achieve your objectives? And can you help yourself achieve those objectives by saving more, working harder, doing other things outside of the capital markets? So, so that's, that's a more holistic, uh, more thoughtful way, and that's in the four pillars of smart investing. Well, doesn't that make more sense? Well, it does, you know, but at the time, the original uh, consulting, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, stocks for the long run, uh, you know, if, if you're going to be in the game long enough. Yeah, go for it. Go for your, it. Your, go, take the risk. You'll be rewarded. Everything will yeah. be happy. And yep. uh, that, that's the way it was. Uh, so, so that has changed. So boomers right now for where they were, where they are, their number one goal should be to protect their assets. Mm hmm Especially now, my gosh. It's uh, well, there's a lot of threats out there, and that reinforces the need to protect. So that should be the primary goal, and that means low risk. Then the other two pillars are diversification, which is always good. It's the only free lunch in investing. And certainly, you don't want to pay more for your investments than you need to. And there's certainly low cost vehicles out there today um, that. Now uh, you should at least be aware of you can do, so the, the the primary choice in terms of cost is active or passive management and there's a lot of very low cost passive management if you believe your active manager can add value then that's all good too but um anyway so that's the four pillars so on the next slide we normally uh, summarize Kath, with with this with this slide but i, I want to reinforce that this whole presentation is available on slideshare um I'll put a link in the description for you guys. Great. And if you go to SlideShare and just put my name in there, it's SIRS, S-U-R-Z, um, you'll, you'll find this show and, and, and basically all of the others. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you for support, but uh, just be aware that uh, we are now on uh, Patreon, and you can click on that thing to uh, to, to see all of the shows and uh, several of my articles. Um, and if you wanted to be a patron, that would be marvelous. Um, but also, we didn't want to leave our viewers with now you know and, and asking yourself, so what do you do next? So we have a website for you called Eight Stage Robo, and that's for the do-it-yourselfers. So if you, if you want to do your own investing or if you have an advisor but you like to, to see um, an, another view of what you might be doing, uh, that's, a good, that's a good website. GlidePath Wealth Management is for people who want to use an advisor, and we can help you there. Um, certainly go see all of our uh, shows, the Baby Boomer Investing shows. And the other thing uh, for fiduciaries on this call, uh, I, I do manage target date funds in the uh, smart funds, and, and they follow the 
glide path that I have patented uh, that is very, very safe at the target date. So, and un unlike virtually all of the other target date funds that are are uh, pretty, they're, they're the 60-40, like I've said before. So there's help. Uh, and you can you go visit these pages, give us any feedback you might like. And then I think the next show, Kath, is gonna, we're going to have a guest. And uh, the guest is going to talk about uh, a variety of things, but how to spend your money in retirement to minimize your taxes, which is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. And that's going to uh, feed into this notion that we haven't talked about at all, which is asset location versus allocation. Okay. So, so the you know, smart thing to do is to put some assets in your tax sheltered accounts, like your IRA or your 401k, uh, and then the other assets in your personal accounts that are taxable. So uh, they're going to help us understand that and help our boomers save their taxes. That's it. Okay, well, I, I have a question now before we end, Ron. <clears throat> Being a baby boomer, <laughs> as you know, uh -huh. um, it scared me when you talked about Medicare and the Social Security going under. For those of the baby boomers that are living on Social Security, is there anything that they can do right now to uh, uh, to prepare for that? That's a good. I I was on the fence about having a Social Security person on, so we're we're going to do that. Okay. Uh, so my personal belief, and it's not to, I'm going to have somebody who spends their their their, their days thinking about this. And I'm sure they'll have a, the, 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 the thoughtful answer. But but I think because there's 78 million of us, mm -hmm. the political will just won't be there to, to take anything away. So what where, what that necessarily means is, is the younger people are going to find you know, they'll change the retirement age. Um, there's already sort of a needs test in terms of what you can make and not pay taxes, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But I think there would be a stronger needs test. You know, the rich people don't really need Social Security. They're getting it anyway. Okay. Uh, so something will give, but I, I, I'd be really amazed if it uh, if it um, you know, was a reduction. What will happen with Medicare? Probably a similar thing. Um, one of the things that ought to happen, uh, it might not, but from what I've been reading, there's there's a lot of abuses in the Medicare system. And in the whole healthcare system. Right. Yeah. So one of the, one of the obvious places to look before you start cutting benefits of any sort is to make that stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's obvious. that's very true. Yeah, but will that happen? It's just like with the with the with the politics right now. Nothing ever happens. All it they do is, right. is it's it's lip service. There's never any re recourse on it. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That, that I think is un it's unfortunate COVID happened and Donald Trump's watch, yeah. um, but, but I think the the election is going to be it's going to be harder for him because it's the economy is such bad shape now. So yeah, yeah, we'll see. definitely. We'll see. Yep. Yeah, and the last question I have, Ron, is there's a lot of baby boomers that haven't retired, or they're just coming up to retirement. Yep. And they've lost their job. One of my friends just lost her job. She still isn't, a, she, she's like 60, 61, 60, something like that. Uh -huh. And uh, she's got the investment, the um, uh, her IRA. She's got two of them. And I know you said to roll it over without a penalty. Now she has, both of hers are. Well, oh, she rolled over her 401k, not, not an IRA. Oh, the 401k. I'm sorry. Yeah, the 401k. Okay. Well, she said that she has them with um, Vanguard and Fidelity. She's got two of them okay. through her employer. So should she leave it there? If she has a target date fund, no. Okay. <laughs> because both of those target date funds are about, you know, I'm going to say this exactly right this time. They are about 50, both of them, 55% in equities. But most of the rest of the assets are in long-term risky bonds. Okay. So my view is that those target date funds are about 80, 90% in risky assets for people who cannot afford to take that risk. Okay. So if she's in a target date fund, that probably means that 
she did not make her own election. Right. Because the, the target date funds are generally for people who can't decide. So their, um, their employer has to decide for them. And the common decision is to do a target date fund. Okay. Now, now the other thing we talked about is um, she, right now with the, the CARES Act, it's capital C-A-R-E-S, um, she can take out up to $100,000 from her 401k penalty free. And, and you told me that her HR people told her that she couldn't, but I, I think I think she can. Yeah. So it, um, I advise against it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because because that's tax that's tax sheltered money. When she takes it out of there, it's not sheltered anymore. Right. Yeah. And especially if she's going to spend it now, she might need it, um, you know, for for her retirement. But yeah, but it's a whole other issue. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people right now that are saying, "I have to deal with what's happening right now." This second, there are, there you are. Know, and they can't pay their mortgages. They can't pay their bills. They can't do anything. So they're in a rock a rock in a hard place. That's true. And yep, it's a desperate, a desperate mode for, for many people. So what a Absolutely. great show, Ron. Thanks for putting the fear of God in me. <laughs> what, what, weren't you afraid of him before? Yeah, right. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really serious. Yeah, okay. It just made me, my face just probably went white when you were talking about Social Security and Medicare, because it, what if, what if? You just yeah. never know. No, I, I think uh, the current boomers will be fine. Okay, but, well, uh, well, well, if, if you're worried about your kids and your grandkids, some somebody's going to be stuck with that bill, and I, I yeah, just, it um, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point there's a rebellion, mm -hmm. and then you know, the people are 15 years old now finally say, "What are we paying for? What is that all yeah. about?" You know, come to think of it, we've never seen seniors protesting. Did you notice that? <laughs> about yeah. about anything to do with senior benefits or any yeah. of that maybe right. it's because we're just too old and too tired <laughs> we i think it's part of it and I, I think you know the, the common belief is that all that money you put in social security was for you right but it wasn't it was for people who were old at that when you were young you yeah. were paying for them you're not yeah. paying for yourself yeah so. right Yes, uh, okay. Well, what a great show, Ron. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, can't, yeah, thanks. Can't wait for the next show. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see you next uh, two weeks from now. Two okay. weeks. Okay. Yep. Bye. Bye.